In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Love is generally measured by the sacrifice, the pain, the suffering that is involved. And we remind our loved ones of how much we love them by what we have undergone for them. And today our attention is drawn to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her seven sorrows. And it seems strange to us to think of Mary having to suffer. She was born immaculate. She is without sin. She deserves no punishment, but yet she is filled with sorrows. She is the mother of sorrows. And I will try to balance that out and remind you she is also the mother of joy. But joy and sorrow go side by side, hand in hand. The joyful souls in heaven, the saints, the angels are filled with joy. But yet there is, you might say, some sadness because they look down upon us and they look down upon mankind and see us going astray and not loving God. Not loving God as we should love God. And that fills them with a sense of disappointment, even though they are in the midst of joy. I think of what the spiritual writers have written concerning the souls in purgatory. They tell us on the one hand that the flames of purgatory are like the flames of hell. They are just as intense, just as painful, and they are suffering terribly. But then they will tell us that these souls in purgatory willingly and cheerfully embrace this punishment, this purification, because it is the will of God, and it is just, and it is necessary, and they are grateful to God for this opportunity to purge their souls of these defects that are keeping them out of heaven. And so intimately, with their suffering, with their great pain and agony, there is a sense of joy. And if you've ever sat around, listened to old people tell you about the good old days and how much they suffered, they are bragging of how much they had to endure and how much more they can endure than we young people can endure. I shouldn't say we young people. I'm getting to be the old one too. But in my day, you ever heard that from the old people? In my day, we had to walk to school. We didn't have school buses. In my day, the winters were much worse. You get a few inches of snow, we got three feet. And we had to walk barefoot to school because we didn't have any shoes, or we weren't allowed to wear out our shoes. And they go on and on with exaggeration after exaggeration, not boasting of how much fun they had, but how hard it was, how poor we were, how many sacrifices we had to make. But yet, <clears throat> there's a sense of joy in their story. There's a sense of happiness. I'm thinking, if it was really that bad, why are you telling me this story? Why are you dragging up all these painful memories? They're no longer painful, but they are badges of honor. You see what I have done. You see what I have endured. And so there seems to be psychologically this strange union between joy and sorrow, between pleasure and pain. And with each sorrow, there's a subsequent pleasure. With each pleasure, there's a subsequent sorrow. And we see this in the life of the Blessed Mother. But I began by suggesting to us that Pain, suffering, sacrifice is a measure of our love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to suffer and die upon the cross. That's the measure of God's love, that he gave his only begotten son. The measure of Christ's love for us, he set aside all the glory of heaven to come to this earth and be one with us and not just equal with us or the greatest of us, but to become the least of us. 
not to enjoy a life of pleasure and ease here on earth, but to enjoy a life of sacrifice, suffering, self-denial, death on the cross. He chose this suffering, this pain, this sacrifice, because he loves us. And now, what are we supposed to do with all of this information? We see the Blessed Mother, who is immaculate. She has embraced suffering, sorrows, sacrifice, great pain, not because she deserved it, because she was immaculate. She is without sin, but because she loves God. And because she loves God, she loves us because God loves us. It is for us that she sacrificed. Yes, she suffered because it was her son. But St. Bonaventure suggests to us, because it was God's will that Christ should be nailed to the cross and suffer and die there, St. Bonaventure suggests the Blessed Mother herself would have done it would have nailed with a hammer those nails into the hands and feet of her only begotten son because it was the will of God. And that is the strength of love. And parents can say to their children, I've spanked you, I've punished you, I've put you in time out, I've sent you to your room, not because I hate you, not because I find pleasure in being mean to you. I punish you because I love you. I correct you because I care. And so I can say God loves us. He sends us crosses, not because he wants to get even with us, not because he takes some kind of evil glee out of seeing us suffer, he sends us crosses, our daily cross, because he loves us. And that cross is essential to our eternal happiness. They go hand in hand. In our society today that's trying to make everything into paradise here on earth is making a grave mistake. Pain is something good, it is something necessary. Sorrow and sadness is something that is necessary. You don't believe me? I say, well, find someone who has lost sensation in their hands and they can no longer feel the difference between hot and cold. Their life is pretty dangerous. They have to be careful what they touch because they can't tell if something is hot as they burn their hand up or if something is cold and they freeze their fingers off because they can't feel. They do more damage to themselves than ever before. And I've often wondered about our, I would suggest, overuse of pain medicine. You have a headache? Well, there's probably a reason you have a headache. Maybe your body needs to rest and take some time off. You need get some sleep or something. But what do we do? No, we take a pain medicine and deaden the pain so we can carry on and push our body even harder and further than it was meant to go. And I think, oh, we're defeating the purpose of pain and doing more harm to ourselves than good. Sometimes pain is given to us for a very good reason and it means it's time to slow down time to stop, but perhaps it's a time to reevaluate and think, why do I have this pain? So that we can live a better life. Why do I have this cross in my life? Because God loves me. And we should come to the conclusion with the Blessed Mother that pain and suffering and sorrow is not just a consequence of our sin, of our transgression, 
but it is a way for us to say to God, I love you. And I find so many people, oh, if I find the perfect husband, if I find the perfect wife, I will be happily ever after. And I can tell you when I used to read these fairy tales to the children, I always misread the last page. And they lived happily never ever. And they say, no, Father, that's not the way it goes. I know how it goes, but I'm trying to break you into the harsh reality of this life. You think you're going to find your prince in shining armor and you're going to ride off into the sunset and everything is going to be okay. Your troubles have just begun and they're only going to get worse. And you want to know whether that knight in shining armor really loves you? Let's see how long he sticks around when the going gets tough. When things aren't easy, and I can say the same to the men, you think she loves you? You think she's going to bring you all this joy? Let's see if she sticks around through hardship and difficulty. And then I get the religious and the religious life, I can say the same thing to them. Oh, I love God and I want to serve God and I'm going to spend all my time in praying and worshiping God and it's going to fill my heart with this great joy. What do you mean I have to wash the dishes? <laughs> Can't we get a dishwasher for that? You're it. <laughs> I have to sweep and vacuum and clean and dust? Yes, you still live in this world. Let's see how much you love. Let's test the limits of your love. How much are you willing to suffer? And I read of a female religious who pray to God, let me endure the pain, the suffering of this illness, this person who is illness, afflict me so that they can be freed from this suffering. I would like to bear this suffering out of love for them, out of love for God. And they would willingly accept whatever physical pain and suffering that someone else was enduring just to set them free. So much so that the religious, religious would begin to fight. No, that one who's suffering that, that, that's for me. I'm asking God for that one. You can't have it. I want that cross. I want that suffering. And I often think these writers who write these lives of the saints probably are exaggerating a bit, but I do see that there can arise this holy competition. Let me prove my love by suffering more. We look at the lives of the saints and they put hair shirts on that constantly scratch them. They put on uh, wear chains for belts around their skin they inflict all kinds of suffering upon their bodies. And I have to remind religious, you cannot do that without the permission of your superior. Because in our zeal, we tend to go too far. But that's where love will take us. I have to encourage during the penitential seasons our children to do penance, to mortify themselves, to skip their sweets and their treats, and to embrace for the love of God. But then after I try to instill this desire in the children, I call the parents aside and says, it's your job to make sure they don't go too far. Your children are not allowed to harm their health. You have to make sure that they eat nutritious food. You have to make sure that they don't make such sacrifices and perform such penances that their health is injured. There is this balance of mixing the joy and the sorrow, the pleasure and the pain. And it is a delicate balance. And that's why children have parents. That's why religious are given superiors. 
But I'm afraid that more often than not, we're not inclined to embrace the penance. We look to Lent or Advent, oh no, not again. When I think we should be looking with anticipation. What a beautiful time for me to purify, to clean house, clean the house of my soul. It's like spring cleaning. Out with the old, let in some fresh air. Let's start anew. And this should be the spirit of cleaning our soul during the penitential seasons, the preparation. And while the cleaning may be burdensome, it may be difficult, we do it because we anticipate the joy, the pleasure that will come later on. But the great wonder is that even in the sacrifice, even in the penance, there is a sense of joy. There's a sense of peace. This is good. We're looking forward to this upcoming feast. We're preparing our souls for this upcoming feast. And in this very preparation, I find joy. St. Paul would compare it to a woman giving birth to a child. She is sad because her hour has come. The pain is exceedingly great. And it is with great pain, great agony, great sorrow that she enters into her travail. But then a child is born. All the pain, all the sacrifice is forgotten because her heart is filled with joy that she now has this child, this gift from God. But for the mothers who've experienced this, they can look back and say, the pain, the sacrifice, it was all worth it. That is, until they get to be about 12 or 13, then maybe they wish they could have undone it. (laughs) But the little baby is precious. Brings great joy. But as I said to the young couple or to the young people dreaming of riding away into the sunset happily ever after, that child is just born, your life is filled with joy, but now your troubles have just begun. That little child wants to be fed every couple hours, 24-7. That little child needs to be changed and monitored. That little child's going to get a respiratory infection and you're going to sit by its bedside all night listening to make sure it's still breathing. And you're going to lose sleep. And you're going to do all of this because somebody's got a gun to your head? No. You do all of this because you love this child. God willingly brought upon himself his cross, his suffering, his sacrifice, because he loved us. The Blessed Mother willingly embraced these sorrows in her life because she loves God, she loves her son, and ultimately because she loves us. She is our mother. And what is required of us, Christ has made it clear. Deny yourself, take up your cross, come, follow me. And don't be afraid of that cross. If you will embrace that cross for the love of me, I will make that cross light, I will make it sweet, I will make it a joy. These little children that are going to grow up to be monsters, they will still bring joy to your heart. That joy can still be yours, even though through the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice. And if we can instill this understanding, this wisdom in the minds of children, we have done a great thing because we have prepared children for the kingdom of heaven. Children who are unafraid to face the obstacles in this world, who are unafraid to fail, to fall down, but realize they have to get up and go again. And I know from religious who have told me that 
They are very grateful that I was there for them because without encouragement, they wouldn't do this, they wouldn't do that because they're afraid of failing. And I would say, well, if you mess it up, you'll just have to do it over until you get it right. What's the big deal? You're sewing, you stitch it up wrong. That's why they make rippers. You tear it back out and you try again. Over and over again until you get it right. But we're afraid of making a mistake. What if I ruin it? So what? It hurts for a little while. It's disappointing. It brings sadness. But hopefully you've learned something. If nothing else, you've learned what not to do. Get up and try again. We need children to understand this in the world in which we live. It's not a sin to make a mistake. It's not a sin to fall down. You just have to remember you need to get back up. Try, try again. Don't give up. We want children to understand this in their schoolwork. Okay, you made a mistake. If you learned from your mistake, let's try this again. See if we can do it right this time. We send you into the trades or whatever. You mess this up, okay. This material is ruined, we have scrapped that. Let's try again. Let's see if we can get it right this time. We need children to be unafraid of making a mistake. Willing to reach out, to extend themselves even if they know there's a pretty good chance I'm going to fail, I'm going to fall, but I will do this for the love of God. There's a pretty good chance that those standing around me are going to laugh at me, mock me, but I will bear that cross when it comes because I love God. And the joy of success comes through multiple failures. The great inventors tell us that there are many inventions that they made that failed, but it wasn't a waste of their time. Every failure showed them what not to do. Every failure shows us what doesn't work. Well, I know not to try that again. We'll try something else now. And it seems our modern world is telling our children, give up. It didn't work the first time. Forget it. And that's not what God wants us to do at all. He wants us to embrace that cross, embrace that difficulty, go back again and again and again. You fell, so what? Get up. You stumbled, okay, collect yourself and continue on. People are laughing at you, who cares? Get up, continue. You made a mistake. Apologize, do your best to correct it, and continue on. It's not time to give up. And if we can get children to do this in the world, we can get them to do it in the supernatural life with their souls. And that is our ultimate goal. Not just our children, but we ourselves. To deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ. To find joy in the cross, to find joy in the sacrifice. To ask ourselves no longer, what is it that I want, because I'm pretty selfish, but to ask, what does God want of me? And then to do what I think God wants me to do, even when it hurts. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris, et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendit Super Vos, et Maniat Semper. Amen.